In this and the next video, we are going to compare WAC with adjusted present value. As we know, WAC is by far the most popular uh, method to compute the discount rate when doing a firm valuation. In previous videos, uh, we uh, discussed several characteristics of, the, of WAC. In this opportunity, we are going to focus on the limitations of WAC given the assumptions of the model. Then we will introduce adjusted present value as an, as an alternative method. There are a number of assumptions in WAC which are relevant for the discussion that we are going to, to have today. There are other assumptions, but the ones that which are relevant are these ones that are, that, uh, are uh, pointed out here. First, WAC assumes that all cash flows are perpetuities. Second, that there is a unique and constant corporate tax rate. And third, that there is a constant leverage ratio. In principle, when these assumptions do not hold, WAC could not be used as a discount rate. Practitioners usually get around these uh, limitations, at least partially, by recalculating WAC according to every period's leverage ratio. Also, when there are other tax effects related to the debt, different from the just the simple corporate tax rate, then also you can incorporate other tax effects by, cal by calculating ca kind of an average tax rate. These are the ways in which practitioners usually, you know, get around the limitations, at least partially, uh, the limitations of WAC. Although this is an improvement, however, this approach is only an approximation, since WAC ends up being adjusted only at the end of each period, usually a year. And actually, the changes take place throughout the year. So uh, rigorously, WAC uh, would have to be adjusted much more frequently in order to, to alleviate these limitations uh, in, a, in a significant way. Let's introduce adjusted present value. The adjusted present value formula is the one we, we see here. The value of the levered firm is equal to the value of the unlevered firm plus the present value of the tax yield minus the present value of the cost of financial distress. So, when we want to compute the value of the levered firm, we first compute the value of the firm, assume, assuming that the firm does not have any debt. And then, apart, we calculate the present value of the shield, and apart, we calculate the present value of the uh, cost of financial distress. And then we add them up together to get the, the value of the levered firm. <clears throat> Under the adjusted present value formula, the tax shield materializes through a cash flow increase and also the cost, the cost of financial distress. You see that uh, the tax shield is, uh, is considered a, tax flow, a, a cash flow and also the cost of financial distress. And then we calculate the present value of each of them. This contrasts with the practical work in which both these effects, the tax shield and the cost of financial distress, are incorporated into the discount rate. So they are not considered uh, cash flow effects. They are just uh, they just modify uh, we just modify the discount rate in order to account for these for these two elements. However, the problem with adjusted present value is that the cost of financial distress are quite difficult to estimate as a cash flow. We would have to do some kind of Monte Carlo simulation or a similar method. Professor Damodaran from New York, New York University proposes a very simple approach to calculate the cost of financial distress in the case of um, adjusted present value. The expected present value of the cost of financial distress is, is, uh, is assumed to be the probability of bankruptcy multiplied by the present value of bankruptcy costs. The present value of bankruptcy costs uh, are estimated to be between uh, uh, about 5% of the value of the unlevered firm 
for the direct cost of financial distress and tw between 25 and 30 percent for the indirect cost of financial distress. So we calculate the, pres the present value of the uh, unlevered free cash flows to get the value of the unlevered firm. Then we multiply that for 25, 30 percent, up to 35 percent, in order to get the expected uh, present value of bankruptcy costs. And if we want to calculate the, 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 the final effect of bankruptcy costs on the value of the firm, we have to multiply by the probability of default. And how we get the probability of default? Well, we can get it from the uh, rating of the debt of the firm. So if the firm's debt is rated, we know that there is um, a table, this table, that uh, tells us what is the probability of default according to each uh, rating level. So we, we, uh, we already have the, all the elements we need to calculate the expected uh, bankruptcy cost in, term, in terms of present value. First, we estimate the value of the unlevered firm. Second, we multiply that by 25 or 30 percent to account for the, the cost of financial distress. And then we multiply by the probability of default, depending on the rating of the debt of the firm, to get the expected present value of bankruptcy costs. <clears throat> APB characteristics. Well, the interesting thing about APB is that given that given that we uh, you, we use the discount rate for the unlevered firm rho. And this discount rate for the unlevered firm, of course, does not depend on the level of debt and does not depend on the profile of the cash flows. So whatever the shape of the cash flows, whatever the profile of the cash flow so during the horizon, rho will stay unchanged. So we don't need to estimate, to assume that the cash flows are, for instance, perpetuities, as we assume you, when we use WAC. The other element is that given that we treat leverage apart from the value of the firm we, we just calculate the present value of the tax yield as, as uh, in a different in a different uh, in, in a different uh, worksheet okay we just estimate the tax yield and we discount the, uh, the tax yield to present value so we treat it uh, separately then of course we don't need to assume a fixed debt ratio as it is assumed uh, in the WAC uh, method and, fi and finally also given that the tax yield is calculated apart, then we can ca estimate the, uh, the tax effects according to the particular legislation of the case we are analyzing. We don't have uh, necessarily to assume a constant and fixed corporate tax rate as we have to uh, when we use the WAC rule. We just estimate the tax savings according to the particular tax legislation. So there is a much more, much more flexibility in the case of APB. So we can see that the APB method is, is a promising uh, as, a, as an alternative to uh, the WAC method. So we can conclude that the practical WAC formula is based on a set of often unrealistic assumptions, basically cash flow perpetuities, constant leverage ratio, unique and fixed uh, corporate tax rate. APB is presented as a promising alternative method to get around the WAC's limitations. In the next video, we will discuss under what circumstances each method is uh, preferable, because WAC is indeed the best method under certain circumstances. So we will discuss in the next video, you know, under what circumstances you should use WAC or you should use APD. And this is all I had to, to tell uh, today.